If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians 1, Philippians chapter 1, and I want to talk to you for a few minutes about where God finishes things, where God finishes things. Philippians 1, while you flip there, uh, just a word about Wednesday evenings in July, uh, Vacation Bible School starts tonight, it's this week, and then every Wednesday evening in July, we're going to be here in the sanctuary uh, worshiping. And uh, there's going to be a kids program downstairs. But I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what, what should we do this year in July? And the Holy, this is exactly what the Holy Spirit said to me. He, he said three words. He said, let it flow. And uh, we're, we're going to have a little bit of a Greenwich outpouring reunion in July. Several of the, the folks that came and ministered to us during that wonderful time of, of outpouring of the Holy Spirit are going to be with us. Uh, Wednesday, July 5th is the first night. Our friend, Pastor Judy Shaw from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. If you've never heard Judy, during the Greenwich outpouring, Judy flew from South Dakota uh, to come minister to us. I've never seen anything like it. And, and she had a dental emergency, something like erupted in her mouth uh, just before she was supposed to come minister to us. And uh, I said, Judy, I said, you know, you don't, you don't have to come. And she said, I'm, I'm coming. And uh, <laughs> she got on a plane and flew to New York. Uh, when she walked in, the service had already started. Her face was swollen like a balloon. And uh, she walked down the aisle. She literally came in so late that she went straight to the front to minister. On her way past my seat, she said to me, you owe me. And, uh, <laughs> and she stood up, and I'm watching her, and I'm like, how is this woman going to, to minister to us with her face swollen like this? And I promise you, while she started preaching the word of God, the swelling disappeared completely from her face. So, uh, and it was, a, it was a very powerful night of ministry. So you don't want to miss Judy uh, on Wednesday, July 5th. And be with us. We're going to just have, a, we're going to have fun. We're going to just worship Jesus. And we're going to just let it, let it flow on Wednesday evenings. All right. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1. Beginning in verse 1. Where God finishes things. Paul and Timothy love slaves of Christ Jesus. Your translation probably says servants. That's a little bit of a weak translation. The word is a slave, a doulos, and it's a love slave. Someone who belongs to another but has stayed with that master by choice. Love slaves of Christ Jesus to all God's saints, God's holy people in Christ at Philippi together with the overseers and deacons. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you might be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to just speak to us. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence with us and your powerful word. Father, may we encounter you today through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. In what kind of place does God finish things? In what kind of place does God give believers breakthroughs and definitive victories? In what kind of place do believers experience the moving of the Holy Spirit and receive miracles? In what kind of place does God confirm believers' faith and their labors of love with good results? In what kind of place do people lay hold of God's promises for their lives and become everything God has called them to become? What qualities 
are found among the believers in such a place? Why do they experience the good outcomes from God that they do? You see, that's the kind of place that I want to belong to. I, I want to belong to a place where God finishes things. I, I want to invest my life and my heart and, and my resources and, and the gifts God has given me. I, I, I want to invest all of those things in a place where God finishes things. In a place like the church at Philippi. Since 2013, we've been following Paul across the New Testament. We started in the book of Acts looking at the conversion and the ministry of Paul. And then we started studying Paul's letters and the order in which they were written. We followed Paul from the Damascus Road through the Arabian Desert to Jerusalem and then to Tarsus. We followed Paul to Antioch and through Syria and Turkey and Greece where he wrote the book of Romans that we just finished together. From Greece, Paul embarked on a fateful trip to Jerusalem where he was arrested and imprisoned for two years and to save his life, he appealed to Caesar in Rome. After almost a year on a prison transport ship, Paul finally reached Rome and Luke tells us at the end of the book of Acts that he was on house arrest for two years in Rome. He was chained 24-7 to a Roman soldier awaiting trial before Nero. Paul couldn't visit his churches, but he could pray for them. And he could write to them. During that two years under house arrest, Paul wrote four prison epistles. This summer, we're going to look at the first one of them, which is the letter to the Philippians, a place where God finishes things. You know, we've been working on our new building for almost three years now. That's a long time. But through all of the delays, God has helped us to build a $24.5 million building for $13.2 million. You know, there are a lot of houses in Greenwich that cost way more than that. We're on target to finish this fall. We still have a little ways to go with our giving. Uh, a few months ago, we presented the need to you, $800,000 to finish the sanctuary, $800,000 to finish the lower level. In response to that, you know, in the last five months, you have given almost a half a million dollars, and you've committed to give $600,000 more. I want to tell you, that is amazing. Thank you. But we're closing in now, and as we get to the summer months, as vacation time comes, I just want to ask you, please, don't forget your giving to the Lord, and, and don't forget your giving to phase two. Have you ever seen a church that was unfinished? You might be surprised to know that there are some very famous churches around the world that are still unfinished. Maybe you've heard of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine on the Upper West Side, Maybe you've been there. It was started in 1892, and it is still only two-thirds complete. You see that tower on the right side? It's not finished, and the one on the left is supposed to be like it. So if it feels like phase two is taking a little while, just be thankful it hasn't been 125 years <laughs> yet. You've heard of Westminster Abbey, where Prince Charles and Diana and where Prince William and Kate were married. But did you know that just around the corner is Westminster Cathedral? It was started in 1895, and it still isn't finished. After 122 years, they are still sitting on folding chairs. If you go to Bermuda, you'll find the unfinished church in St. George started in 1874, and it's still not done, but apparently it's a nice place for a wedding. In Clearwater, Florida, the Church of Scientology started the Superpower Building in 1999. It was supposed to take two years and cost $40 million. 18 years and $145 million later, it still isn't done. I don't know what kind of superpower they have, but I'm thankful that we have a superpower that helped us build our building for half the cost, not triple the cost. Of course, everybody knows the most famous unfinished church of all, the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, Spain. It was started in 1882. 
there have been lots of delays, but it is under construction again. They expect to finish in 2026. It's been hard enough to sustain momentum for three years. I can't imagine sustaining momentum for 144 years. See, I want to be part of a place where God finishes things. And what kind of place is that? Well, looking at Paul's opening words to the Philippians, I see seven qualities of a place where God finishes things. Now, don't let the number seven give you a heart attack because we do have another service at 1130. So no matter what happens, I have to be done by then. So let's talk. Where does God finish things? Let's talk about seven qualities in Philippians chapter one. First, God finishes things where believers have a shared experience of grace. God finishes things where believers have a shared experience of his goodness. In his prison chains in Rome, Paul receives a love offering from his friends in Philippi. And as he holds that love offering in his hands, he remembers them and his heart overflows again with love for them. He calls Timothy to his side and he begins to dictate a letter to Timothy, the most personal of all of his letters. Paul and Timothy love slaves of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ in Philippi. You see, in the very first breath, Paul reveals what it was that created that special bond that he had with the Philippians. It was their shared experience in Christ. All of you, he writes, who believe are now saints in Christ. Something supernatural has happened to you. You have been chosen and called by God and you have been set aside by him to live an extraordinary life of belonging to him. You have come into a new spiritual experience. You have come into a new state of being, into a new existence in this life called in Christ. Grace to you. The favor of God to you, the blessings of heaven to you, the empowering presence of God with you, and shalom, wholeness, inner security, well-being, mental and emotional stability, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 7, Paul says, all of you share together in God's grace with me. In other words, what created that bond between Paul and the Philippians was that they had the same spiritual experience, the life-changing encounter that Paul had on the Damascus Road now happened to the Philippians as well. And not only did they have that shared experience of God's saving grace, they, they had the shared experience of God's sustaining grace over the 10 years since they first met. You see... Our shared experience in Christ is what makes us different from anything else on earth. Beloved, I want to tell you that the church of Jesus Christ is different from any other religious community on earth. The church is different from any other institution. It's different from any other organization. It's different from any other club. The church is supernaturally joined together in Christ. And we are supernaturally held together in Christ. We belong to the Father. And we belong to one another in an unbreakable family bond. Because we're in Christ, Paul says in verse 8, that we have Christ's affection in our heart for one another. The love that Jesus feels for each one of us in this room, we also feel for one another. And Paul calls our shared experience of grace just the beginning of God's good work among us. You all know that. Wonderful verse in Philippians 1, verse 6. He who began a good work in you. You know how it really reads in the New Testament is, he who began a good work among you will be faithful to complete it. 
You see, that, that moment that God called us to salvation, it was just the start of his grace. We've only started to experience his goodness. We've only started to experience his loving kindness. We've only started to experience all of his favor and faithfulness, all of his delivering power, all of his transforming glory. And listen, where we will experience more and more of his good work in us is among us. Yes. I want you to catch this. Yes. As we worship, as we fellowship, as we serve alongside other believers with the shared experience of grace, that's where God carries on the completion of his good work in us. Amen. I want you to, to grab this, what the, the meaning, the significance of Paul's words here. We take this promise in Philippians 1, 6 personally, and we apply it personally, and we should. But, but there's a key in here. He who began a good work in you will complete it among us. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. God will work in you among us. God will work in me among us. Among us is where God finishes the good things that he started in us. Where does God finish things? Seven qualities in Philippians 1. He finishes things where there's a shared experience of grace. Number two, God finishes things where believers have the DNA of ready responders. As Paul holds that offering from the Philippians in his hand, he recalls how they were responsive to the gospel from the very first day. And he recalls how they responded again and again and again when Paul was in need. The church in Philippi was founded during Paul's second missionary journey. After a series of closed doors, Paul had a vision one night of a Greek man calling him to come over and help them. When he arrived in Philippi, Paul found that there was no Jewish synagogue there, which means there weren't even 10 Jewish men in the whole city. And that was the minimum number of men that you had to have to form a synagogue. When that was the case, if there was any Jews at all in the city, they would form a little prayer group. So on the Sabbath day, Paul went walking along the riverbank, and sure enough, he found a small huddle of God-fearing women. These were not Jewish women. They were Gentile women who were interested in the Jewish God and the Jewish faith, but they had never converted. Paul sat down and began to tell these women about Jesus. And Luke says in Acts 16 that God opened Lydia's heart and enabled her to respond to the gospel. Her whole house responded and they were baptized. A few days later, there was a jailhouse rock and the prison warden became a ready responder along with his whole household. And that inclination to become ready responders became the DNA of the Philippian church. Again and again, they responded readily when Paul was ministering in Thessalonica and he was so intense to support himself, the Philippians sent an offering to support him. When Paul was ministering in wealthy Corinth and so intense to support himself, the Philippians sent an offering to support him. When Paul was taking up a collection for the needy saints in Jerusalem, he, he didn't plan to pass the plate in Philippi because they were suffering extreme economic uh, uh, persecution. Their, their businesses were being sidelined because of their faith in Christ. And so Paul wasn't going to bother them for the offering. But he writes in 2 Corinthians, that they begged for the privilege to be included in the offering. Can you imagine that? Oh, please, Pastor Glenn, don't, don't leave me out of the offering. Don't, don't, don't rob me of the privilege of giving in this offering. Ready response was their DNA. And now in Rome, the Philippians sent Epaphroditus to come and serve Paul any way he could to wait on Paul to serve his needs, and they sent a love offering. If you want to know where God finishes things, it's where believers have that ready responder DNA. Find a gathering of believers that had a supernatural beginning and have response in their DNA like the believers in Philippi. You know, my home church in Philadelphia 
was that kind of a place. It was born during a revival, born of the Spirit out of a move of God, and that church had the, the DNA of ready responders. I want to tell you that harvest time is also that kind of a place. In my office, I, I have a folder of letters going back to the early 1970s, even the late 60s. There was a, a spirit-filled prayer group here in Greenwich that prayed for years that a spirit-filled church would open up here. And, and they kept writing to our district superintendent in Massachusetts asking him to open a spirit-filled church in Greenwich. I have the letters. I have the letters that they sent, and I have the letters that he sent in response saying no. Again and again, they wrote, please open a church in Greenwich. Again and again, he wrote back and said no. In 1983, the Lord spoke to Pastor Ray and Patty Tate. They were ministering in New Jersey, and God told them to leave their ministry position and plant a church. They started driving up and down I-95 from Delaware all the way to really southern Maine, back and forth, and every time they passed through Greenwich, they felt something go off in their heart. They pulled off the highway and began driving around, and God told them, spoke to them, and said, there is a harvest here in Greenwich. That's why we're called Harvest Time Church. They went to the district superintendent, the one who wrote time and again, no, 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 no. And they said, we want to open a church in Greenwich. And he said, yes. You see, when God opens the door, no man can shut it. Our first service was Christmas Eve of 1983. There were two unbelievers in that service, both of them found Jesus that night, and ready response has been in our DNA ever since. Do you know what you did last week? You gave over $15,000 to our friends in New Delhi, taking care of orphans, boys and girls in the slum, because ready response is in your DNA. God finishes things where believers have a shared history of his presence and of miracles. As Paul remembered everything God did in Philippi from the first day until the present, his heart overflowed. And the same thing happens to us as we recall how we began and how far God has brought us. It makes our hearts overflow with love and thanksgiving and faith. Some of you have been here all 34 years of the ride. Denise and I have been here for 20 21 years of the ride. Some of our staff members have been here longer than us. Maybe you're new to harvest time. I want to say if you're new to harvest time, let's make some beautiful history together. See, God has brought you here for such a time as this. In a few years, we're going to look back and say, isn't it amazing how God sent you just in time to move into the new building? Isn't it amazing how God sent you just in time to help us launch new ministries to reach more people for Jesus than we've ever reached before? Isn't it amazing how God sent you just in time for the next wave of the Holy Spirit, in time for the next revival, in time of the greatest season of miracles we have yet to come? I want to tell you, God has brought you to a place born of the Holy Spirit with ready response in the DNA. This is a place where God finishes things. Where does God finish things? Seven qualities in Philippians chapter 1. Got to fly now. Number three, God finishes things where believers are structured for success and sustainability. There's something interesting in Paul's greeting to the Philippians. He includes in his greeting the overseers and the deacons. It's the only place in all of Paul's letters where he gives a, a greeting to the overseers and the deacons. So it's curious. Many people believe the reason why is because this is a thank you letter. He's thanking the church for the love offering that they sent. And he's verifying to the leaders that the offering has been received in full. You see, Epaphroditus was accountable to the overseers and the deacons in the church to make sure that the funds were handled properly. And what that tells me is that the Philippian church was structured for success and for sustainability. They were organized and they were in good order. You know, some believers today read the Bible and they have this notion that the early church was some kind of unstructured free-for-all. But I want to tell you, beloved, that was never the case. 
Even by the end of Acts chapter 2, which starts with the day of Pentecost, by the end of Acts chapter 2, we see that the church had a recognized leadership, it had a catechism, it had a liturgy, and it had set times for worship. In Acts chapter 6, when the leadership structure is expanded, the church goes from growing by addition to growing by multiplication. In Philippi, there were overseers and deacons. The equivalent would be pastors and ministry leaders. One of the things that you'll discover about God is that he is intensely strategic and practical. Beloved, I want you to listen because here's a key. God does not pour out miracles where there is no ability to receive and retain them. When God wanted to pour out a blessing of oil on a widow in debt, he told her through Elisha, go around and gather as many vessels as you can. Assemble structures to receive what I'm about to pour out. When Jesus turned 180 gallons of water into fine wine, he made sure that there were six ceremonially clean water jars to receive the good wine that he was about to bless them with. You see, God is practical that way, and I feel like there is a word for somebody here. God is ready to release your miracle. You need to assemble the structures to receive it and retain it. If that's your word, just take it in Jesus' name. Where does God finish things? Seven qualities in Philippians 1. He finishes things where there's a shared experience of grace, where there are ready responders, where believers are structured for success and sustainability. Number four, God finishes things where believers are in constant prayer. One thing that's evident from all of Paul's letters is that prayer was absolutely the key to his ministry. The key to Paul's open doors for ministry was prayer. The key to the deep conviction that fell on people while Paul was preaching was prayer. The miracles in Paul's ministry, the key to them was prayer. It all went on prayer. He mentions prayer several times here in Philippians chapter 1. Verse 4, he says, I'm always praying for you. Verse 10, this is my prayer for you. Verse 19, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit, I'll be delivered from these chains. So how was it that Paul was able to sustain this constant prayer life for the Philippians? It had been 10 years since he had first come to them. How was he able to sustain prayer for them over 10 years? How was he able to keep on praying for them when he was in chains? How was he able to pray for their needs when his own needs were a lot more dire? Well, I see a couple of keys here from his words in Philippians 1. First of all, pray with thanksgiving because it produces joy and faith. In verse 3, Paul says that his prayers for the Philippians always begin with thanksgiving. He remembers what God did by the riverbank on that first Sabbath day. He remembers how God opened Lydia's heart and how she opened her home to host the church. And he thanks God for it. He remembers what happens on that night when there was a supernatural earthquake and the prison warden and his whole family were baptized in the middle of the night and he gives thanks for it. He remembers how ready response was in the DNA of the Philippians and they sent offerings to him again and again and he gives thanks for it. And Paul says that by remembering what God has done, joy is in his spirit and faith. Surely God didn't start all of this for nothing. Surely God didn't move in such a powerful way in Philippi only to see the church fizzle or to see it have mediocre results. No, God surely intended it to be the start of something huge. Do you know that's exactly how I pray for phase two? Every time I pray for God's help to finish phase two, which is every day, I begin by thanking God for the miracles that he's done so far. I thank him for the miracles that he did to help us buy this land. It was a miracle. Government would not allow anybody to buy this land for 40 years. Believe me, a lot more wealthy and powerful men than me tried to buy it. 22 of them tried to buy it. No one was allowed to buy it. God did miracles for us. Yes. 
I thank God for the miracles that he did to get us into this building. And I thank God for everything good he's done in this building. And it produces joy and it produces faith in my heart for phase two. Surely God didn't start all of this for nothing. Surely God didn't move in such a powerful way only to see things fizzle or to see us have less than a, an absolutely victorious outcome. And you can pray that way too, beloved. Listen to me. Here is a key. Before you begin to petition God for your needs, start by thanking him for what he has already done. And as you thank him for what he's done, joy and faith will grow in your heart. And then you'll be able to pray for those needs. How how do we sustain prayer? Pray with thanksgiving. Another thing I find is pray with loving hope. Hope is the character of God. We learned that in Romans 15. He is the God of hope. Hope is the very essence of his nature. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, is a description of God's love for us. And Paul says that God's love perseveres in hope. It always believes the best. It always hopes the best. And it was that affection of Christ that Paul used when he prayed for the Philippians. He prayed for them believing the very best for them hoping the very best for them. And we need to pray in that same kind of loving hope as well. Pray forward-looking prayers. Evidently, there were some issues in the Philippian church, just like in every church. Paul addresses some of those issues in this letter. But when it came to prayer, Paul was forward-looking. He didn't pray about where they had been. He didn't pray about where they were today. Paul prayed about where they were going in Christ. He didn't pray about what they were not. He prayed about what they were about to become in Jesus. And we need to pray that way too. Let's pray forward-looking prayers that propel people forward into the plans and purposes of God for their lives. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray for joy, being confident that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Where does God finish things? Seven qualities in Philippians 1. He finishes things where there's a shared experience of grace, where people are ready responders where they're structured for success, where there's constant prayer. Number five, God finishes things where believers have a strong spirit of faith in he. Philippians 1.6 is one of the best loved promises in the whole Bible. I want you to know as a pastor, I cling to this promise. And not for the completion of buildings. I cling to this promise because it gives me hope for God's people. It gives me hope for the wandering ones. It gives me hope for the wavering ones. I want you to notice with me where Paul's confidence lies. Paul loved the church, but his confidence wasn't in the church. He loved people, but his confidence wasn't in people. He had a mighty apostolic calling, but his confidence was not in his ministry. Paul's confidence was in he. I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will finish it. Paul was confident in the character of God, that God is a finisher. Paul understood that it is not in the nature of God to start something and not finish it. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus' final words of his earthly humiliation was, It is finished. God is a finisher by nature. You know, Moses was having a bad... I pray this way sometimes. Moses was having a bad day one day. The people, children of Israel, were getting under his skin. And so he climbed up on a mountain. And he said, look, Lord, I'm just saying. I'm not saying, but I'm just saying. You're the one who got us into this. You're the one who who opened the door to the desert through the Red Sea. You're the one who brought us out here. And if you don't finish this, everybody's watching. And they're going to say you couldn't do it. You started it, Lord. You have to finish it. And some days I pray that way. I I walk around. If you want to know, people wonder what I do. 
I, I was the GC for this building, which GC, by the way, means get coffee. So I just, <laughs> I just went and got coffee while everybody worked. I was the, but everybody wonders what I do. I, I don't do anything for this new building. I just walk around several times a day praying in tongues is what I do. And on some days, I, I climb up on the top of that scaffolding and I say, like Moses, look, Lord, I'm not saying, I'm just saying, you're the one who started this. You have to finish it. Paul understood that he is a finisher of, it's in his nature, it's in his character to finish. I want to tell you, I cling to this promise. It's a promise that we will be fruitful. It's a promise that we will prevail. It's a promise that we will make it. We will achieve God's purposes in our lifetime and finish the work he set out for us. We will have longevity. We will bear lasting fruit. We will pass down our faith to our children and to our grandchildren. And they're going to do even more for Christ than we ever dreamed of doing. And it's all because of he who began a good work. Where does God finish things? Number six, God finishes things where believers are not ashamed of the gospel. God finishes things where believers are not ashamed of the gospel. The Philippians loved the gospel. The first time they heard it, they responded to it. They supported the ministry of the gospel by giving again and again and again to Paul. And listen to me, when the gospel was under persecution by society, they refused to be ashamed of the gospel. They refused to abandon the gospel. They refused to water down its message in order to avoid persecution. Somebody, you listen to me today. Paul said in verse 7, You've continued being my partners, even in my chains. You see, the Philippians could have easily distanced themselves from Paul while he was in prison. It was not good to be known as friends of enemies of Nero. Now, wait a minute. Paul, we don't want that kind of trouble here. We don't want that kind of negative attention. We don't want to be associated. We don't need that kind of bad press here. But instead, the Philippians stood with Paul. They identified with him. They supported him. Paul says they were his partners in defending and confirming the gospel. Those are two legal terms from a court of law. That word defending is the word from which we get apologetics, the defense of our faith. That word confirming means to offer convincing proof. You know, I wonder how we measure up today on defending and confirming the gospel. Beloved, listen, since the very beginning, the gospel has always created controversy, and it always will. The only reason that we've experienced a little less of that in the United States up till now is because we were predominantly a Christian country until a few decades ago. But how are we doing now? When society criticizes us for believing things that Christians have believed for 2,000 years, are we ashamed of the gospel? Are we tempted to water down its contents in order to avoid controversy, in order to avoid persecution? Are we prepared to explain our faith and defend our faith? Jesus said, if any, listen, Jesus said, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words, I will be ashamed of him when I come in my Father's glory. As my friend Jackson Sinyanga says, I don't, I don't say that to scare you, I say that to terrify you. <laughs> Several years ago, Pastor Nick and I did a sermon series called Clean. It was about getting free from sin. One of the topics that we talked about was pot. We had a week that we called Weed, weed Week. We hung Weed Week banners out on King Street. We brought in the head of the Addiction Recovery Unit from St. Vincent's Hospital to talk about the devastating consequences of pot. We called it blunt talk about marijuana. One of our students came up with a slogan, HTC instead of THC. But we had a group of students at the time who were seriously devoted to pot. They destroyed $700 worth of banners out on King Street. 
They wrote Facebook treatises defending pot. They actually did an impressive amount of work. They researched, they wrote eloquently, they, they wrote persuasively. And when I saw that, I, I, I thought, that's exactly how we're supposed to stand up for the gospel. That's how we're supposed to stand up for Christ. That's how we're supposed to stand up for the Bible. That's how we're supposed to defend our faith. That, that's the fiery passion that God is looking, that fiery passion to vigorously defend pot. That's the kind of fiery passion that God is looking for in our hearts for him. Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. You know, I haven't stopped praying for that group all these years. Some of them have had amazing encounters with the Lord and they're completely free. Some of them are still coming along, but, but I'm praying forward-looking prayers in loving hope. I'm praying that one day very soon they're going to be as outspoken for Jesus as they once were for pot. Why was Paul confident that Philippi was a place where God would finish things? Paul knew that God wouldn't quit on Philippi because Philippi refused to quit on God and they refused to quit on the gospel. Where does God finish things? Worship team, help me finish. We're in trouble, help me finish. Where does God finish things? Seven qualities. God finishes things where there's a shared experience of grace. God finishes things where there's ready responders. God finishes things where believers are structured for success and sustainability. He finishes things where there's constant prayer. He finishes things where there's a strong spirit of faith. He finishes things where believers are not ashamed of the gospel. And finally this, God finishes things where believers are growing more and more in love. In verse 5, Paul tells the Philippians he's always praying for them. In verses 9, 10, and 11, Paul tells what he prays. And what he prays is simply this. He prays for more and more love. The, the joyful, lovingly hopeful, forward-looking prayer of Paul is simply this. That they would have more and more love. That they would experience more and more of God's love within and that they would express more and more of God's love without. Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, with all your strength, with your body, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Don't have time to unpack this prayer. We're going to look at it more next week, but I'll leave you with this. This is the good work that God is praying God will, that, that Paul is praying God will finish. Beloved, let me tell you, God's good work in your life ultimately is not his blessing on your career or your finances. He does promise that he'll give you the ability to get wealth. God's good work is, is not your good health. He does promise that he'll heal you, that he'll preserve you. His good work is, is not that your kids become doctors or lawyers or pro athletes or Wall Street tycoons. He, he does promise that he'll show favor to a thousand of your generations. God's good work isn't even a finished church building, but he does promise he'll build this church. God's good work among us is more and more love experiencing more of his love and expressing more of his love. I don't know about you, but I want to be part of a place where God finishes things. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place today? Come on, let's give him a good praise today.